The Dawn Flows Home to the Sea, Part 1, by Mikhail Sholokhov, continued. The clerk and the warder flew like frightened sparrows, and the commander pressed against the wall, his face whiter than the whitewash, and hissed through his teeth, There they are, but I shall make a complaint. I'll give you good cause for complaint. You're too used to the rear. Brave fellows arresting women and old men. I'll shake up the lot of you. Ride off to the front, you serpent, or I'll cut you down where you stand. Gregor thrust his sword into its scabbard and struck the terrified commander with his fist, driving him with his knee and fist towards the outer door and roaring, To the front! Go on! Go on! Damn you, you rear lice! He thrust the man outside, and hearing an uproar in the inner yard of the prison, ran that way. At the entrance to the kitchen stood three warders. One of them held a rusty Japanese rifle and was shouting hurriedly, An attack is being made on the prison. We must drive him off. That's the old law. Gregor pulled out his pistol, and the warders ran headlong into the kitchen. Come out, all of you, and go home, Gregor roared throwing open the doors of the crowded cells. He released all the prisoners, some hundred persons altogether, forcibly dragged out those who were afraid to go, drove them into the street, and locked up the empty cells. A crowd began to gather outside the prison gates. The released prisoners poured into the square and hurried home. The Cossacks of the guard ran out of the staff headquarters across the square to the prison, Kudinov accompanying them. Gregor was the last to leave the empty prison. As he passed through the crowd, he swore at the inquisitive women, and with hunched shoulders walked slowly to meet Kudinov. The Cossack guard, running across the square, recognized and greeted him. He shouted to them, Go back to your quarters, boys. What are you running for? Quick march! We heard there was a mutiny in the prison, comrade Melyakov. It's a false alarm, he replied. The Cossacks turned and went back, laughing and talking. Kudinov hurriedly approached Grigor, stroking his long hair as he came. Hello, Melyukov. What's up? he exclaimed. Your health, Kudinov. I've just broken into your prison. On what grounds? What game are you playing? I've let them all out. What are you staring at? On what grounds have you been arresting women and old men? What game are you playing? Don't you dare to take your own line. You're behaving high-handedly. I'll behave high-handedly with your body. I'll bring my regiment straight back from Kargin, and then you'll see a high hand. Grigor suddenly seized Kudinov by his Caucasian leather belt and, stuttering with cold fury, whispered, If you'd like me to, I'll open the front at once. If you want it, I'll part your soul from your body on the spot. He ground his teeth and released his hold of the quietly smiling Kudinov. Adjusting his belt, Kudinov took Grigor by the arm. Come along to my room. What are you boiling over like that for? You should see what you look like. A very devil. We've been wanting to see you here. As for the prison, that's nothing. You've let them out, but there's no harm done by that. I'll tell the lads to be less obstreperous in arresting the women whose husbands are with the Reds. But why are you undermining our authority here? Ah, Grigor, you're a headstrong lad. You could have come to us and said the prisoners ought to be released and so on. We'd have looked through the lists and set some of them free. But you let them all go. It's a good job we keep the important criminals separate, for if you'd released them... He clapped Grigor on the shoulder and laughed. Grigor pulled his arm out of Kudinov's grip and halted outside the staff headquarters. You've all grown very brave here behind our backs, filled the prison with people. You might show your abilities out there at the front. I've shown them no worse than you in my time, and I would now. Come and take my place, and I'll take over your division. No, thank you. Ah, that's just it. But we're wasting a lot of time talking about nothing. I'm going home to get a rest. I've been unwell, and I've been wounded in the shoulder. What have you been unwell with? Yearning. Grigor smiled wryly. No, but joking apart, what's the matter with you? We've got a doctor prisoner here. He was with the sailors at Shumilinsk. He might have a look at you. He can go to the devil. Well, then go home and rest. Whom have you put in charge of your division? Ryabchikov. 
But wait a moment. What's the hurry? Tell me what's been happening at the front. We heard yesterday that single-handed you've been killing sailors without number at Klimovsky. Is that true? Goodbye. Grigor strode away. But when a little way off, he turned round and shouted, If I hear that you've started arresting again... The day was declining. A chilly wind crept up from the dawn. A flock of teal flew over Gregor's head with a whistle of wings. As he was entering the yard where the horses were stabled, the sound of gunfire came to his ears from the upper reaches of the river. Chapter 12 In Tatarsk, Gregor found life empty and dreary without the other Cossacks. Rarely were any of them able to get back to the village on furlough. Only once at Easter time, half the Tatarsk Infantry Company turned up in the village. They spent a day there, changed their clothes, collected dripping, dry toast, and other eatables, and then crossed the dawn like a crowd of pilgrims, but with rifles instead of staves, and marched off in the direction of Yelanska district. From the hill above Tatarsk, their wives, mothers, and sisters watched them depart. The women howled with weeping, wiping their eyes with the ends of their kerchiefs and shawls, and blowing their noses into the hems of their skirts. Along the farther bank of the dawn, over the sandy dunes, marched the Cossacks, Kristonia, Anikushka, Pantoljemen Prokofievich, Stepan Astachov, and others. The linen bags containing their victuals hung from their fixed bayonets, their mournful songs were carried away by the wind, and they talked languidly among themselves. Most of them marched dispiritedly, but they were clean and their stomachs were full. Before the holiday, their wives and mothers had heated water and washed away the dirt ground into their bodies and had combed the blood-swollen lice out of their heads. Among them were boys of sixteen and seventeen, freshly mobilized into the ranks of the insurgents, throwing out their legs bravely over the warm sand, for some unaccountable reason talking and singing gaily. For them, war was a novelty, like a new game. During their first days of fighting, they would raise their heads from the harsh earth to listen to the bullets whistling over their heads. Greenhorns, the front-line Cossacks contemptuously called them as they taught them to dig trenches, to shoot, to carry their equipment on the march, and even the art of delousing themselves and of wrapping their feet in rags so that they should not get tired so quickly in their heavy boots. But meantime, the lad would stare out on the world around him with astonished bird-like eyes, raising his head and gazing out of his trench afire with curiosity, trying to see the reds while the reds' bullets whistled past him. If death was his portion, the sixteen-year-old soldier would stretch himself out and lie like a great child with boyishly round arms, and he would be carried back to his native village to be buried in the grave where his forebears were rotting. His mother would meet him, wringing her hands and crying aloud over the dead, tearing the gray hair from her head. And when the body was buried and the clay on the mound was drying, the aged, bowed mother would carry her unquenchable sorrow to the church, there to remember her dead son. But if the bullet had not inflicted a mortal wound, then only would the lad begin to realize the merciless nature of war. His lips would tremble and writhe. The soldier would cry out in a childish voice, Oh, mother, mother! and little tears would roll from his eyes. The ambulance cart would shake him up over the trackless fields. The company medical officer would wash the wound and laughingly comfort him as if he were a child. Now, Vanya, don't behave like a crybaby. But the soldier Vanya would weep, would ask to go home, call for his mother. If he recovered and returned to his company, then indeed he was beginning to have a thorough understanding of war. Another week or two of battles, of bayonet fighting, and then see him stand in front of a captive red soldier and with feet set wide apart, spitting like any brutal sergeant major, hear him hiss through his teeth. Well, peasant, so you're caught, you bastard. So you wanted the land, wanted equality. I expect you're a communac. Tell us, you snake. 
In his anxiety to show his daring and Cossack frenzy, he would raise his rifle and club the man who had come to his death on the Don lands, fighting for the Soviet government, for communism, for the abolition of war from the earth. And somewhere in Moscow or Vyatka province, in some lonely village of the enormous Soviet Republic, a mother would receive the report that her son had fallen in the struggle against the white guards for the emancipation of the toiling people from the yoke of the landowners and capitalists. She would read it again and again, tears running down her cheeks. Her motherly heart would be consumed with a burning grief, and every day until she died she would remember him whom she had carried in her womb, whom she had borne in blood and woman's agony, him who had fallen under an enemy's hand somewhere in the unknown dawn region. The half-company of Tatarsk infantry marched over the sandy dunes through the ruddy willows. The youngsters marched gaily, thoughtlessly. The older men with sighs, with secret hidden tears. It was time to plow, to harrow, to sow. The earth called them, called incessantly, day and night, and they had to go and fight, to perish in strange villages from enforced inactivity, from fear, need, and yearning. The soldier remembered his tiny husbandry, his implements and livestock. Everything was in need of a man's hand. Everything wept without the master's overseeing. What could a woman do? The earth would dry out. The seed would not sprout. There was the danger of famine next year. So the older men marched silently over the sand. They grew animated only when one of the youngsters sent a bullet after a hare. For such a waste of a good bullet, the elder men decided to punish the offender. Their anger was poured out on him. Forty strokes for him, Pantelyeman suggested. Too many. He won't reach the front after that. Sixteen, Christonia roared. On sixteen they decided. They stretched the offender out on the sand and drew down his trousers. With his clasp knife, Christonia cut switches covered with fluffy yellow catkins from the pussy willows, and Anikushka laid on. The others sat around smoking. Then they marched on again. Behind them dragged the sufferer, wiping away his tears and holding his trousers clear of his flesh. As soon as they had reached the end of the sandy waste and came out on black earth, Passing plowed land, each of the Cossacks bent down, picked up a clod of the dry, sun-baked earth in his hand, crumbled it between his palms, and sighed, The earth is ready. Three days more, and it won't be possible to sow. It's a little early on this side of the dawn. Yes, it's early, all right. Look, you can see the snow still lying on the hills. They halted for the midday rest. Pantelyeman Prokofievich treated the punished lad to some sour milk. He had carried it in a linen bag tied to his rifle barrel, and water had leaked from the bag all along the road. As he offered the milk, he said, Don't you be angry with your elders, you young fool. They've whipped you, but there's no woe in that. If they'd laid the blows on you, Daddy Pantelyeman, you'd be talking in a different tone. I've had much worse than that, my lad. My father once struck me on the back with a cart shaft. A cart shaft? I said a cart shaft, didn't I? Eat up that milk. What are you gaping at me like that for? They didn't give you enough this morning. The morning after Grigor's arrival in Tatarsk, he went with Natalia to visit old Grishaka and his mother-in-law. Lukinichna greeted them with tears. Grisha, my son, we shall be lost without our Miran, peace to his soul. Who will work our fields for us? The granaries are filled with seed, but there's no one to sow it. We're left orphans. Nobody wants us. We're strangers to everybody, unwanted. Look how our farm is going to rack and ruin. Not a hand is raised to repair it. In very deed, the farm was rapidly decaying. The fences around the yards were overthrown, the mud wall of the shed had been eaten away by the spring water and was crumbling. The threshing floor was unfenced. The yard, littered and dirty, rusty and broken farm machinery lay by the shed. Everywhere were the signs of desolation and decay. 
Things have gone to pieces quickly without the master, Gregor thought unconcernedly as he went round the farmyard. He returned to the hut and found Natalia whispering to her mother. But as he appeared, she lapsed into silence and broke into a wheedling smile. Mama's just been asking, Gregor, she said. You were going out to the fields tomorrow. You might sow an acre or so for her. But what do you want anything sown for, he asked. Your bins are crammed with wheat. Lukinichna clapped her hands. But, Grisha, what about the earth? she asked. Our dead Miran plowed up a lot of land. Well, what of it? It'll lie, won't it? If we're alive this autumn, we'll sow it. But Lukinichna stuck to her guns, grew cross with him, and at last pursed up her trembling lips. Very well, if you haven't got time. But there's no one to help us. Oh, all right. I'm going tomorrow to sow for ourselves, and I'll sow a couple of acres for you. That should be enough. Grishaka's alive and well, isn't he? Thank you. Thank you. Lukinichna brightened up at once. I'll tell Agrippina to bring the seed along to you today. Granddad, the Lord hasn't yet taken him to himself. He's alive, but he's gone a little funny in his head. He sits at home all the time and reads the Holy Scriptures all night. Sometimes he talks and talks, but it's all meaningless church language. You might go and see him. He's in his room. I looked in just now, Natalia said, a tear rolling down her cheek. But she added with a smile, He said to me, You saucy baggage, why don't you ever come and see me? I shall be dead soon, my dear. I'll put in a word to God for you and my little grandchildren. I'm pining for the earth, Natalia. The earth is calling me. It's high time. Grigor went in to see the old man. The smell of incense, of must and decay, the smell of an aged, slovenly man filled his nostrils. Grishaka was still wearing his old gray tunic. His trousers were in good order, his woolen socks darned. Since Natalia's marriage, the care of the old man had passed to his second granddaughter, Agrippina and she looked after him with the same love and attention that Natalia had formerly shown. He was holding a Bible on his knees. He looked up at Grigor from under his spectacles, opened his mouth, and showed his teeth in a smile. Still hold, then, soldier, he said. So the Lord has defended you from the bullets. Well, praise be. Sit down. So you're still well, Granddad. Eh? I say you're still well. You're a queer lad, a queer lad. How can I be well at my age? I'm nearly a hundred now, yes, nearly a hundred. And it seems only yesterday that I was walking with red hair, young and well, and as if I'd woke up today to find myself all decay. Life's flown by like a summer's day. My coffin's been lying in the shed these many years, but it seems the Lord's forgotten me. Sometimes I pray, Lord, turn your merciful glance on me, your Grishaka. You'll live a long time yet, old man. Your mouth is full of teeth. Teeth? (laughs) You're a queer lad. Grishaka grew cross. You won't keep your soul in with your teeth when it makes ready to leave the body. So you're still fighting? Yes, still fighting. That's what I said. But what are you fighting about? You don't know yourselves, but it's all working out according to the divine command. Our earth is doomed to death. We've gone contrary to God. The people have risen against the authorities, and all government is from God. Even if it's the government of Antichrist, it's God-given all the same. I told Miran, Miran, don't make the Cossacks rise. Don't talk against the government. Don't drive the people on to sin. But he said, No, father, I can't stand it. We must rise. We must destroy this government. It's ruining us. We used to live like men, but now we're a lot of old men. But he'd forgotten that they who take the sword shall perish by the sword. And it's true. The people say you've been made a general and command a division, Grishka. Is that right? Yes. But where are your epaulets? We don't have them now. Don't have them now. What sort of general are you, then? In the old days it was a treat to look at the generals. 
They were well-fed, big-bellied, and looked important. But you now, look at you. Your great coat's all muddy. You've got no epaulets, no white cords across your chest. You're nothing but lice, eaten up with lice. Grigor burst into a roar of laughter, but Grishaka continued bitterly. Don't you laugh, you scum. You're leading men to their death. You've raised them against the government. It's a great sin you've committed. All the same, they'll destroy you and us with you. God will show you his will. The Bible tells us all about these troublous times of ours. Listen, and I'll read you the testimony of the prophet Jeremiah. The old man turned over the yellow pages of his Bible with his yellow fingers and began to read, slowly enunciating each syllable. Declare ye among the nations, and publish and set up a standard. Publish and conceal not. Say, Babylon is taken, Bel is confounded, Merodach is broken in pieces, her idols are confounded, her images are broken in pieces. For out of the north there cometh up a nation against her, which shall make her land desolate, and none shall dwell therein. They shall remove, they shall depart, both man and beast. Do you understand, Grisha? From the north they are coming and binding us Babylonians and removing us. Listen to this. In those days and in that time, saith the Lord, the children of Israel shall come, they and the children of Judah together, going and weeping. They shall go and seek the Lord their God. My people hath been lost sheep. Their shepherds have caused them to go astray. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. But what are you getting at? How are we to take all that? Gregor asked, only half understanding the archaic language. This, you scum, that you troublers of the people run to the hills, and then you're not shepherds to the Cossacks, but worse than the silly sheep themselves. You don't understand what you are doing. Listen to this. All that found them have devoured them. There it is. Aren't the lice devouring us now? There's no getting away from the lice, Grigor admitted. So it fits perfectly. And it goes on. And their adversaries said, We offend not, because they have sinned against the Lord, the habitation of justice, even the Lord, the hope of their fathers. Remove out of the midst of Babylon, and go forth out of the land of the Chaldeans, and be as the he-goats before the flocks. For lo, I will raise and cause to come up against Babylon an assembly of great nations from the north country, and they shall set themselves in array against her. From thence she shall be taken. Their arrows shall be as of a mighty expert man. None shall return in vain. And Chaldea shall be a spoil, all that spoil her shall be satisfied, saith the Lord. Because ye were glad, because ye rejoiced, O ye destroyers of mine heritage. Daddy Grishaka, you might explain it all to me in simple language. I don't understand it at all, Grigor interrupted. But the old man chewed his lips, stared at him with an absent gaze, and replied, I'll be finished in a minute. Listen. Because ye are grown fat, as the heifer at grass, and bellow as bulls. Your mother shall be sore confounded. She that bear you shall be ashamed. Behold, the hindermost of the nations shall be a wilderness, a dry land and a desert. Because of the wrath of the Lord it shall not be inhabited, but it shall be wholly desolate. Every one that goeth by Babylon shall be astonished and hiss at all her plagues. What does it all mean? Gregor pleaded again, beginning to get a little irritated. The old man did not reply, but closed the Bible and lay down on the stove. And everybody's like that, Gregor thought as he went out of the room. 
When they're young, they have a good time, drink their vodka, and sin like the rest. But when they're old, the more they raged in their youth, the more they seek to save themselves from God. Here's Grishaka with teeth like a wolf's. They say that when he used to come home from service, all the women in the village wept because of him. All fell before him. And now, if I live to old age, I shan't be like that. I'm no Bible thumper. As he and Natalia returned home from their visit, Grigor pondered on his talk with the old man and the mysterious, incomprehensible prophesyings of the Bible. Natalia also walked along without speaking. She had been unusually cold to her husband on his arrival this time, and evidently stories of his conduct with the women of Kargin district had reached her ears. On the evening of his return, she had made his bed for him in the best room, but had herself slept on the chest, covering herself with a sheepskin. She uttered not a word of reproach and asked him no questions, and Gregor had not said anything that night, deciding that it was better for the time being not to ask her why she was so unusually chilly in her welcome. They walked silently along the deserted street, feeling more alien to each other than ever before. From the south, a warm, gracious wind was blowing, and white clouds were gathered in the west. Distant thunder rolled faintly, and the village was scented with the blessed, vital perfume of opening buds and the moist black earth. White-maned waves coursed over the blue sweep of the dawn. The lower edge of the plowed land lying in a velvety black pall along the slope of the hill was steaming, and wisps of mist went floating over the dawnside hills. A skylark was singing drunkenly right over the road, and marmots were whistling. Above all this earth, breathing with great fruitfulness and an abundance of life-giving forces, hung a proud and lofty sun. In the middle of the village, close to a little bridge over a gully burbling with flood water, Natalia halted. She bent as if to tie up her shoelace, but in reality to hide her face from Grigor and asked him, Why don't you speak? Well, what is there to talk about? There's plenty to talk about. You might tell me how you tippled in Kargin, and how you ran after whores. But you know already... He pulled out his tobacco pouch and began to roll a cigarette. He puffed at it once or twice, then asked in his turn, So you've heard about it? Who told you? As I can talk about it, of course I know. All the village knows, so there's plenty to hear it from. Well, if you know, what is there to tell you? He walked on with great strides. The sound of his footfalls and Natalia's more frequent steps rang out clearly in the transparent spring silence. She walked on for a moment without speaking, wiping away her tears. Then, choking down her sobs and clutching his arm, she asked, So you're starting your old tricks? Shut up, Natalia. You accursed, never-satisfied hound. What are you torturing me again for? You should listen less to other people's lies. But you've just admitted it yourself. It's clear they've told you more lies than truth. I am a little to blame. Life itself is to blame, Natalia. All the time you're living on the edge of death and sometimes you crawl across the furrow. How about your children? Aren't you ashamed to look them in the face? Ha! Huh? Ashamed? Gregor bared his teeth in a smile and added, I've forgotten how to be ashamed. How can you feel shame when all your life's messed up? There you are, killing people. You don't know what all the mess is about. Ah, but how am I to tell you? You'll never understand. It's only a woman's cruelty that's speaking in you, and you'll never believe that my heart is gnawing me. And I turned to vodka. The other day I went off into a fit. For a moment my heart stopped beating and my body turned cold. His face darkened, and the words came with difficulty. It's hard for me, and anything to forget it. Vodka or women? Wait, let me finish. Something here is sucking and sucking at me, drawing all the time. Life's taken a false turn, and maybe I'm at fault in that too. We ought to make our peace with the Reds and attack the cadets, but how? 
Who will bring us into touch with the Soviets? How are we to strike an account for our common injuries? Half the Cossacks are beyond the Donets, and those who are left behind have gone mad. Everything is mixed up in my head, Natalia. Your granddad, Grishaka, read the Bible to me and said we hadn't done right. We shouldn't have risen. He cursed your father. Granddad's not right in the head. It's your affair now. That's the only way you can judge. You can't get to see anyone else's point of view. Oh, you needn't try to talk me over. You've done me wrong, and you've admitted it. But now you're trying to put everything onto the war. You're all of you the same. It's no little sorrow I've had through you, you devil. It's a pity I didn't finish myself off that time. There's no point in our talking any more about it. If it's hard for you, cry. Tears always ease a woman's pain. But I can't be a comforter to you now. I've dabbled so much in men's blood that I've got no pity left for anyone. The war's dried it all out of me. I've grown hard. Look into my soul and you'll find a blackness like an empty well. They had almost reached the hut when a stinging, slanting rain began to fall. It laid the dust on the roads, rattled on the roofs, and was refreshingly cool. Gregor unfastened his greatcoat and covered the weeping Natalia with it, putting his arm around her. So they went into the yard, pressed close together, covered by one greatcoat. In the evening he got the plow and the sower ready in the yard. Simeon, the smith's fifteen-year-old son, who had learned his father's trade and was the only smith left in Tatarsk, fastened the share to the old plow. The bullocks had come well through the winter, for the hay left them by Pantaliemon had been ample for their needs. Next morning, Grigor made ready to drive out into the steppe. Ilinichna and Dunya had been up betimes to light the fire and prepare food by dawn. He thought to spend five days at work, sowing for themselves and his mother-in-law, plowing four acres for melons and sunflowers. Then he would recall his father from the infantry company to finish the sowing. The lilac smoke ascended in a spiral from the chimney. Dunya ran about the yard, collecting brushwood for the fire. Grigor stared at her shapely waist, at the swelling breasts, and thought sadly and vexedly, how the time has slipped by. It flies past like a mettlesome horse. It was only the other day that Dunya was a sniveling girl, with her pigtails dancing over her back as she ran, and now she's ready for a husband, and I'm going gray-haired. Old Grishaka was right. Life has passed like a summer's day, and such a little while is man allotted to live, yet we must shorten it still more. Daria came up to him. She had recovered very quickly from the loss of Piotr. For a little while she had mourned, going yellow with grief and seeming to age. But as soon as the spring breezes began to blow and the sun to warm the earth, her grief had passed with the melting snows. The blush was reddening her cheeks again. Her eyes glittered, and her former easy, swinging walk had returned. Her old habits had returned also. She was painting her eyebrows again. Her cheeks shone with cream. She had recovered her love of joking, of teasing Natalia, and her lips were parted in a smile. Triumphant life had recovered command. She came up to Gregor smiling. The scent of cucumber cream came from her face. Can I give you a hand, Gregor? she asked. What with? Ah, Grishka, why have you grown so stern with me, a widow? You never even smile. You might go and give Natalia a hand. There's Misha all dirty with running through the mud. And is that my job? You to give them birth and I to wash them for you? No, thank you. Your Natalia's as fruitful as a rabbit. She'll be giving you ten more before she's finished. And I'd get tired with washing them all. Enough. Enough. Off with you. Gregor Pantelievich, you're the only Cossack left in the village at the moment. Don't drive me away. Let me look at your attractive black whiskers from a distance at least. Grigor laughed and tossed his hair back from his forehead. I don't know how Pyotr managed to live with you. You needn't be afraid, she replied, 
and glancing at him with her consuming half-closed eyes, with feigned alarm, she looked behind her at the hut. Supposing Natalia was to come out now, how jealous she is of you. I took one little peep at you today, and her face completely changed. The young women were saying to me yesterday, What sort of law is this? There are no Cossacks left in the village, and Gregor has returned and won't leave his wife's side. How are we to live? Even if he is wounded, even if there's only half of him left, we'd be glad to have our pleasure of that half. Tell him not to go into the village at night or we'll catch him and he'll suffer for it. I told them, No, my girls, our Gregor only plays about in other villages, but when he's at home he clings to Natalia's petticoat and won't leave her. You are a bitch, Gregor remarked, laughing with amusement. I am what I am. But your lawfully wedded Natalia, the undefiled, she gave you a good talking to yesterday, and you won't be going beyond the law. Don't meddle in other people's affairs, Daria. I'm not. I only meant to say that your Natalia's a fool. Her husband comes home, and she goes for him, weeps, and lies down on the chest like a penny piece of gingerbread. I wouldn't deny myself a Cossack if I got the chance. I'd put even a brave fellow like you to fear. She grated her teeth, laughed aloud, and went off to the hut, looking back and laughing at the embarrassed Gregor. You were happy in dying when you did, Brother Piotr, Gregor thought. That Daria is not a woman, but a she-devil. She'd have been the cause of his death in any case, sooner or later. Chapter 13 The last lights had been extinguished in Bakhmutkin village. A fine frost was sheeting the puddles with a thin shroud of ice. Somewhere in the fields beyond the village, belated cranes had settled, and the northeast wind brought their quiet, weary chatter to the ears of the inhabitants, emphasizing the placid silence of the April night. In a yard a cow lowed, then was quiet, Snipes called yearningly as they flew through the darkness, and there was a whistling of innumerable wings from a flight of ducks hastening to the free expanse of the flooded dawn. On the outskirts of the village there was a sudden outbreak of human voices, the snort of horses, and the scrunch of frozen mud under their hoofs. A patrol of the two squadrons of the 6th Special Brigade, quartered in the village, rode into the main street. With talk and song they scattered among the yards, tying their horses to overturned sledges and putting down fodder for them. The sound of their voices floated out to the Cossacks posted on guard beyond the windmill. It was dreary, lying at night on the cold, frozen earth. No smoking or talking for the guard, nor even the attempt to warm themselves by clapping their hands together. They lay among the stalks of last year's sunflowers, staring into the yawning darkness of the steppe, listening with ears set to the earth. Ten paces away, nothing was visible, and the April night was so rich in rustles and suspicious noises that any one of them might be caused by a Red Army soldier crawling towards them. With his glove, one young Cossack wiped away a tear caused by straining his eyes in the darkness. He thought he heard the sound of a broken twig and a smothered panting a little way off. He jogged his neighbor with his elbow. The rustle of the brushwood and the heavy breathing grew more distinct and unexpectedly sounded right above the youngster. He rose on his elbow and, staring through the undergrowth, with difficulty made out the form of a great hedgehog which was hurrying along with nose to the ground on the track of a mouse. Suddenly it felt the presence of an enemy close to it, raised its head and saw the man staring at it. The Cossack sighed with relief. The devil, how it frightened me. The hedgehog tucked in its head and for a moment became a prickly ball, then slowly unrolled and crawled away, knocking against the sunflower stalks. Again the silence descended. In the village the second cock crowed. The sky cleared of clouds and the first stars peered down through the thin veil of mist. Then the wind swept the mist away, and the sky gazed down on the earth with innumerable golden eyes. 
Just then the young Cossack heard the distinct sound of a horse's hoofs and a jingle of metal in front of him, then a moment later the creaking of a saddle. The other Cossacks heard it also, and fingers were lightly set to rifle triggers. The silhouette of the rider emerged as though cut out against the background of the day. He was riding at a walking pace in the direction of the village. Halt! Who goes there? The Cossacks jumped up, ready to open fire. The horseman halted and raised his hands above his head. Don't fire, comrades, he cried. What's the password? The officer in charge of the outpost shouted. Comrades, what's the password? Troop, stop. I'm alone. I surrender. Wait a bit, brothers. Don't fire. We'll take him alive. The troop commander ran to the rider. The man swung his leg over the saddle and dismounted. Who are you? A red? Yes, brothers, there's the star on his hat. You're finished. Conduct me to your commander, the horseman calmly replied. I have to take a communication of great importance to him. I am Voronovsky, commander of the Sirdobsky regiment, and I have come to negotiate with him. An officer? Kill him, brothers. Comrades, kill me by all means, but first let me tell your commander what I have come for. I repeat that it is highly important... Take my weapons if you're afraid I shall run away. He began to unfasten his sword belt. The troop commander took his revolver and sword. Search him, he ordered, seating himself on the officer's horse. After the search, the troop commander and another Cossack drove the prisoner towards the village. He went on foot, the Cossack escort at his side, and the troop commander riding his horse behind him. He stopped frequently to light cigarettes and the scent of the good tobacco aroused his escort's cupidity. Give me one, the Cossack asked. The officer handed him his full cigarette case. The Cossack took out a cigarette and thrust the case into his own pocket. The red commander said nothing, but as they were leading him into the village, he asked, Where are you taking me? The Dawn Flows Home to the Sea, Part 1, by Mikhail Sholokhov, continued. The Red Commander said nothing, but as they were leading him into the village, he asked, Where are you taking me? You'll know soon enough, but tell me, to the company commander. Will you lead me to your brigade commander, Bagatiriev? There isn't any such man here. There is. I know he arrived with his staff in Bakhmutin yesterday. We don't know anything about that. Oh, enough of this, comrade. I know it and you don't. It isn't a military secret, especially when it's known to your enemies. Go on, go on. I'm going on. So you'll lead me to Bagatiriev? Silence. We're not allowed to talk to prisoners. But you are allowed to take my cigarette case. Get on and keep your tongue still or I'll put my bayonet through you. They found the company commander asleep. He sat up, rubbing his eyes and yawning, unable at first to take in what the troop commander was telling him. At last he said, Who do you say you are? The commander of the Serdobsky regiment? You're not lying. Where are your documents? A few minutes later he conducted the red commander to the quarters of the brigade commander Bagatiriev. As soon as he heard who had been captured, Bagatiriev jumped up as though possessed. He hurriedly buttoned up his trousers, lit a lamp, and asked the officer to sit down. How were you... how was it you were captured, he asked. I came voluntarily. I want to talk to you alone. Order the others to go out. Bagatiriev waved his hand, and the company commander and the gaping master of the house left the room. His face expressive of his curiosity, Bagatiriev sat down at a table. The officer, Varanovsky, smiled under his black mustache. Allow me first to say a word or two about myself, he said. Then I will tell you the mission on which I am come. I am a noble by birth, and was a staff captain in the Tsar's service. During the German war I served at the front. In 1918 I was mobilized by decree of the Soviet government, and am now in command of the Red Serdobsky Regiment. For some time I have been waiting for an opportunity to come over to your... 
to the side of those fighting the Bolsheviks. You waited a long time, Captain. I know. But I wanted to wipe out my guilt to Russia by not only coming over myself, but bringing the Red soldiers under me as well, or rather the most reliable of them, who had been deceived by the communists and dragged into the fratricidal war. Glancing at Bagatiriev and noticing his unbelieving smile, Varanovsky started like a girl and hurriedly continued. Naturally, you must feel a certain amount of distrust in me and my words. I should feel the same in your place. Let me prove to you by irrefutable facts. He threw back his greatcoat and drew a penknife from his pocket, ripped the hem of his greatcoat with it, and drew out some yellow documents and a tiny photograph. Bagatiriev carefully examined the documents. One of them certified that the bearer was Lieutenant Varanovsky of the 117th Lyubomirsky Regiment and was signed and sealed by the chief surgeon of a field hospital. The other documents and the photograph conclusively proved the truth of Voronovsky's statement. Well, and what next? Bagatiriev asked. I have come to inform you that I and my assistant, the former Lieutenant Volkov, have been working among the Red Army men under our command, and the entire complement of the Serdobsky Regiment, with the exception, of course, of the Communists, is ready at any moment to come over to your side. The men consist almost entirely of peasants from Saratov and Samara provinces. They are prepared to fight the Bolsheviks. We only need to come to an agreement with you on the conditions for the surrender of the regiment. At the present moment, the regiment is stationed at ust -Hapiersk. It numbers about 1,200 bayonets, and there are 38 in the communist nucleus, plus some 30 men who have formed a platoon of local communists. We shall seize the battery attached to the regiment, but probably the battery complement will have to be wiped out, as the majority of them are communists. My Red Army men are in a ferment because of the food requisitions which are taking place in their districts. We have utilized this circumstance to bring them over to the side of the Cossacks. But they are afraid that if they surrender, they may be subjected to violence. And so, although it is a detail, I must come to an understanding with you on this point. What violence can there be? Well, murder or pillaging. No, we shall not allow that. One other point. The soldiers insist that the Syrdobsky regiment is to be maintained as a whole and is to be allowed to fight the Bolsheviks as a separate military unit side by side with you. It is not in my power to decide on that point. I understand. You must communicate with your higher command and will let us know. Yes, I must inform the staff at Vyshenska. Excuse me, but I have very little time, and if my return is delayed, my absence may be noticed by the regimental commissar. I think we shall be able to come to an agreement on the terms of the surrender. Let me know the decision of your command as soon as possible. The regiment may be transferred to the Donets front, or reinforcements may arrive, and then I shall send a courier to Vyshenska at once. One other thing. Order your Cossacks to return me my arms. They not only disarmed me, he broke off and smiled with embarrassment, but they took my cigarette case. That, of course, is a detail, but it is of value to me as a family heirloom. Everything shall be returned to you. How are we to inform you of Vyshenska's answer? In two days a woman will come to Bakhmutin from Ustrapiatsk. The password, well, let it be Union. You can inform her. Of course, under the conditions I have stated, within half an hour a Cossack courier was galloping to Vyshenska. The next day Kudinov's personal orderly arrived in Bakhmutin. He rode up to the brigade commander's quarters and, entering the hut without stopping to tie up his horse, handed Bagatiriev a packet marked Urgent and Secret. Bagatiriev hurriedly tore open the envelope and read the letter, written in Kudinov's sprawling writing. The news is encouraging. I empower you to conduct negotiations with the Serdobsky regiment and at any cost to get them to surrender. I suggest we concede their requests and promise that we shall receive the regiment in its entirety and shall not even disarm them, on the indispensable condition that they capture and hand over the commissar of the regiment and the communists, especially our own Vyshenska, Yelanska, and Ust-Hapiersk communists. 
Also, the battery, baggage train, and regimental equipment must be captured. Hurry the matter as much as you can. When the regiment is ready to come over, bring up as large a force as possible, quietly surround them, and at once disarm them. If they try to resist, kill them to the very last man. Act cautiously but resolutely. As soon as they are disarmed, drive the entire regiment to Vyshenska along the right bank of the Don, so that they are far from the front and have to march through the open steppe. Then they will not be able to escape. We shall distribute them in twos and threes among different companies, and shall see how they fight the Reds. Afterwards, if we succeed in uniting with our men on the Donets, they can do as they like with them. If they hang them, to the last man I shan't object. I rejoice in your success. Keep me informed by courier daily. Kudinov. In a postscript was written, If the Sierdobsky regiment hands over our local communists, drive them under a strong escort to Vyshenska through the Donside villages. Choose the most reliable Cossacks for the escort, the fiery and the older men, and tell them to inform the villagers in advance of their coming. There's no point in our soiling our hands with them. The women will settle them with pikes if the escort does the job properly. That will be the wisest policy for us. If we were to shoot them and the Reds heard of it, they might shoot their prisoners. And it's simpler to let the people loose on them to unleash the people's anger like a bloodhound, lynching and no questions asked or answers received. Chapter 14 Late in April, the 1st Moscow Regiment was seriously defeated in a battle with the insurgents. Not knowing the locality, the Red Lines fought their way into Antonovsky village, only to find themselves floundering in a sea of mud. While driven on by the stubborn orders of their commanding officer, they were struggling to make their way through. Two companies of mounted Cossacks encircled them, and after losing almost a third of its complement, the regiment had to retire. During the battle, Ivan Alexievich was wounded in the foot. Mishka Koshevoy carried him out of the fight and compelled the driver of an ammunition wagon to give him a lift. The regiment was driven back as far as Yelanska village. The defeat had disastrous results on the entire advance of the Red detachments in the area. A general retreat set in, and the 1st Moscow Regiment, finding itself cut off by the breaking of the ice at the mouth of the Khoper River, crossed the Don to the right bank and halted at ust Khapyersk, there to await reinforcements. Shortly after their arrival, they were joined by the Sierdobsky Regiment. The Sierdobsky men were very different from those of the 1st Moscow Regiment. The workers of Moscow, Tula, and Nizhny Novgorod, who formed the main and militant body of the Moscow Regiment, fought fiercely, stubbornly, frequently engaging in hand-to-hand -hand struggles with the enemy, and continually losing men killed and wounded. Even after their defeat in Antonovsky village, they had retired without losing one ammunition wagon. But the men of the Sierdobsky regiment had been hurriedly enrolled at Sierdobsk in Saratov province, and consisted chiefly of elderly peasants, most of them illiterate, and many of them drawn from rich families. The men in command were mainly former Imperial Army officers, the Red Commissar was spineless and had no authority over the soldiers, and the commanding officer, Varanovsky, and others were carrying on a secret agitation to demoralize their men and to persuade them to surrender the regiment to the Cossacks. On the arrival of the Sierdobsky regiment, Stokman, Ivan, and Mishka were transferred to the new regiment and were quartered in the same hut as three Sierdobsky men. Stockman anxiously noted the sullen spirit of his new companions, and after one sharp conflict with them, he came to the conclusion that a serious danger threatened the regiment. Two Sierdobsky men entered the hut one evening, and, without a word of greeting to Stockman or Ivan, remarked, We've had enough of fighting. They're seizing our family's grain at home, and here we have to fight for we don't know what. So you don't know what you're fighting for, Stockman queried. No, we don't. The Cossacks are farmers just like us, and we know why they rebelled. Oh, yes, we know. Stockman's customary restraint failed him for once. And do you know what language you are talking now, you swine? He exclaimed. White guards language. Not so much of your swine, or we'll give you one. Did you hear him, boys? 
Quieter, quieter, Longbeard. We've seen the likes of you before, a second intervened. Do you think that because you're a communist you can seize us by the throat? You look out or we'll plug you full of holes. He came across to Stockmann. You're talking like counter-revolutionaries. We shall try you as traitors to the Soviet regime, Stockmann panted, pushing the man off. You won't send all the regiment to the tribunal, one of the Serdobsky men replied. The communists get sugar and cigarettes and we get nothing. That's a lie, Ivan Alexievich shouted, raising himself on the bed. We get the same as you. Without another word, Stockmann put on his greatcoat and went out. They made no attempt to stop him, but jeered as he went. He found the commissar of the regiment in the staff headquarters. Calling him into another room, he informed him of his quarrel with the Syardobsky men and proposed their arrest. The commissar listened to him, scratching his beard and irresolutely adjusting his horn-rimmed spectacles. We'll call a meeting of the communist nucleus tomorrow to discuss the position, but I don't think it's possible to arrest them in the present situation. Why not? Stockman asked sharply. Well, you know, Comrade Stockman, I've noticed myself that there's something wrong in the regiment. Probably there's some form of counter-revolutionary organization at work, only I can't discover it. But the majority of the regiment is under its influence. There are peasant elements, and what are you to do? I've informed the divisional staff of the state of things, and have suggested that they should withdraw the regiment and reform it. But if you noticed the attitude of the majority, why didn't you inform the political department long since? I tell you, I have but they're slow in replying. As soon as the regiment's withdrawn, we shall punish severely all those who have violated discipline. He added with a frown, I have my suspicions of Voronovsky and the chief of staff, Volkov. After the meeting of the nucleus tomorrow, I shall ride to ust to discuss the position with the political department. We must take urgent steps to localize the danger. But why not call a meeting of the nucleus at once? Time won't wait for us, comrade. I know that. But it isn't possible at the moment. The majority of the communists are on outpost duty. I insisted on that, as I thought it risky to trust any non-party elements in such a situation. And besides, the battery, which is manned chiefly by communists, will only arrive tonight. I summoned it here in connection with this trouble in the regiment. Stockmann returned from the staff to his hut and told Ivan and Mishka the outlines of his talk with the commissar. After the others had gone to bed, he sat up writing a detailed statement of the position in the regiment, and at midnight awoke Mishka. Giving him the letter he had written, he said, Get a horse from somewhere at once and ride to ust with this letter. At all costs, even of your own life, you must hand it in at the political department of the 14th Division. How long will it take you to get there? Where will you find a horse? As he drew on his boots, Mishka replied, I'll steal a horse from the mounted patrol, and I shall be at ust in two hours at the most. The horses are a poor lot, or I'd do it in less. I know which horse to take. He took the letter and slipped it into the pocket of his greatcoat. Why put it there? Stockman asked in surprise. I can get at it easier if I'm caught, Mishka replied. Yes, but, Stockman doubtfully began, if they catch me, I can get at it and eat it. Brave lad, Stockman smiled faintly, and as though overcome by a mournful presentiment, he put his arms around Mishka and embraced him, kissing him with cold, quivering lips. Off with you, he said. Mishka went out, successfully untied one of the best horses of the patrol, and rode cautiously through the village and past the outpost his forefinger against the trigger of his rifle. Only when he came out on the high road did he sling the rifle across his shoulder and set to work to extract the last ounce of speed from his little Saratov horse. At dawn a fine rain began to fall. The wind howled and heavy storm clouds drove up from the east. As soon as morning came, the Syodobsky men, quartered with Stockman, rose and went out. Half an hour later, a Yelanska communist named Tolkachev, attached like Stockman and Ivan to the Syodobsky regiment, 
flung open the door of the hut and panted, Stockman, Koshevoy, are you here? Come out. What's the matter? Come in here, Stockman called, picking up and hurriedly putting on his greatcoat. There's trouble in the regiment, Tolkachev muttered as he followed Stockman. The infantry attempted to disarm the battery as it drove up just now. They started shooting, but the gunners drove off the attack, removed the gun locks, and crossed by boat to the other side of the river. There's a meeting going on by the church now. All the regiment... Get dressed, quickly, Stockman ordered Ivan Alexeyevich. He seized Tolkachev by the sleeve. Where's the commissar? Where are the rest of the communists, he demanded. I don't know. Some of them have fled, but I came along to you. The telegraph office has been occupied, and no one is allowed in. We must clear out, but how? The man dropped helplessly on a bed, his hands between his knees. At that moment, there was the sound of steps in the porch, and six Sirdobsky men ran into the hut. Their faces were flushed and harsh with evil determination. All communists to the meeting! Hurry up! they shouted. Stockman exchanged a glance with Ivan and compressed his lips. We're coming, he replied. Leave your arms behind. You're not going into a battle, one of the men suggested. But Stockman slung his rifle across his shoulder as though he had not heard and was the first to go out. Eleven hundred throats were roaring in the square. Stockman went towards the crowd, his eyes seeking for members of the regimental command. Past him went the commissar, his arms held by two Red Army men, while another thrust him on from behind. His face deathly pale, the commissar pushed through the crowd. A minute or two later, Stockman saw him mount a table in the middle of the mob. Stockman looked round. Behind him was Ivan Alexeyevich. At his side were the men who had come to fetch him to the meeting. Comrades of the Red Army, the commissar's words sounded faintly amid the roar of voices, to hold meetings at such a time as this, when the enemy is so near. Comrades! He was not allowed to continue. Around the table the gray Red Army caps shook as though rocked in the wind. Fists were stretched out towards him, and shouts arose. So we're comrades now. Pull the leather jacket down. Kill him. Bayonet him. We've had enough of his commissaring. Stockman saw a huge elderly Red Army man clamber onto the table and seize the commissar's little beard. The table rocked, and the man and the commissar tumbled together into the outstretched hands of those pressing around. A gray mass of greatcoats seethed where the table had stood, and the commissar's desperate shout was lost in the solid thunder of voices. Stockman at once began to push his way to the center of the crowd, thrusting the men ruthlessly aside. No one tried to stop him, but fists and rifle butts urged him on, the rifle was torn from his back, his Cossack cap from his head. At the overturned table, his way was barred by a troop officer. Where are you shoving to, the man roared. I want to speak. Let a rank-and-file soldier say a word, Stockman cried hoarsely, setting the table on its legs. Some of the men around him even assisted him to clamber onto the table, but the tumult in the square did not die away, and Stockman shouted at the top of his voice, Silence! After a moment, the noise died down a little, and he cried in a voice quivering with emotion, Comrades of the Red Army, shame on you! You're betraying the people's government at the most serious moment possible. You're wavering just when it is necessary with a firm hand to strike the enemy to his heart. You're holding meetings when the land of the Soviets is struggling for existence in an iron ring of enemies. You're on the verge of downright treachery. And why? You have been betrayed to the Cossack generals by your own treacherous commanders. These former officers have abused the trust of the Soviet government, and exploiting your ignorance are planning to surrender the regiment to the Cossacks. Come to your senses. With your hands they want to assist to strangle the workers and peasants' government. The commander of the second company, a former officer, was about to throw his rifle to his shoulder, but Stockman caught his movement and cried, Don't you dare! You'll have plenty of time for that. I demand that you listen to a soldier communist. We communists have given all our lives, all our blood, drop by drop, in the service of the working class and the oppressed peasants. We are used to looking death right in the eyes. 
You can kill me. We've heard enough. Let him finish. Conflicting shouts arose. Kill me, but I repeat, come to your senses. Now is not the time to hold meetings. You ought to be marching against the whites. He swept his eyes over the half-silenced crowd of soldiers and noticed Voronovsky, the commander of the regiment, standing a little way off, smiling forcedly and whispering to a Red Army soldier at his side. "'Your regimental commander!' Stockman shouted, stretching out his hand and pointing to Varanovsky. But the officer put his hand to his mouth and whispered something to the man standing beside him, and before Stockman could finish his sentence, a shot rang out in the humid air of the rainy April day. Stockman clutched at his breast and fell to his knees. His bare, iron-gray head was lost to sight, but he jumped to his feet again and stood swaying. Osip Davidovich, Ivan groaned as he saw Stockman rise. He started to fight his way towards him, but the men around him seized him by the arm and muttered, Shut up! Give up your rifle, you swine! They disarmed him, went through his pockets, and led him off the square. The other communists were at once hunted down and disarmed also. In a side street close to a merchant's house there were five or six shots as they killed a communist machine gunner who refused to surrender his gun. Meantime, Stockmann, choking violently, his face white as chalk, his lips frothing with rosy blood, stood swaying on the table. With the last effort of his will, the last remnants of his strength, he managed to shout, They have tricked you, the traitors! They're earning their own pardon and new officers' positions. But communism will live. Comrades, come to your senses. Again the soldier standing beside Voronovsky threw his rifle to his shoulder. The second bullet sent Stockmann down headlong from the table under the soldier's feet. A Syadovsky soldier jumped onto the table and roared, We've heard a lot of fine promises, comrades, but they've all been empty talk and threats. And now this fine orator is dying the death of a dog. Death to the communists, to the enemies of the toiling peasantry. I say that our eyes are opened, and we know who are our enemies. What was it they told us in our villages? They said there would be equality, the brotherhood of the people. That's what the communists told us. And what have we got in reality? Cannibalism, brothers. My father sent me a letter with the marks of his tears on it and said they were robbing and stealing in broad daylight. They've taken all the grain from my father, and their decree hands it over to the toiling peasantry. And if the poor peasants are going to get fat on what they take away from my people, then I ask you, what is that but robbery and cannibalism on the part of the communists? Kill them with fire and blood. The speaker was not allowed to finish his speech. From the west, two squadrons of Cossack cavalry rode at a trot into the village. Down the southern slope of the Donside Hills marched Cossack infantry, and Bagatiriev, the commander of the special brigade, rode into the square with his staff and half a squadron for escort. The Syrdobsky regiment began hurriedly to line up in double file. Hardly had Bagatiriev's group appeared in the distance when their commander, Voronovsky, cried in such a tone of stern command as the Red Army men had never heard before, Regiment! Attention! As soon as the insurgent squadrons entered ust Hapiersk and surrounded the Syrdobsky regiment, the brigade commander, Bagatiriev, went off with Voronovsky to hold a conference. It was held close to the square in one of the merchants' houses, and was quite brief. Without putting down his whip, Bagatiriev greeted Varanovsky and said, Everything's gone fine. It will be put to your account. But why weren't you able to save the guns? An accident, a pure accident, Commander, Varanovsky replied. The artillery men were communists, almost to a man, and they put up a desperate resistance when we tried to disarm them. They killed two of our men and fled with the locks. A pity. Bagatiriev threw his cap on the table, and wiping his sweating face with a dirty handkerchief, smiled grimly. Well, everything's fine. You go and talk to your soldiers. Tell them they're all to give up their arms. Jarred by the commanding tones of the Cossack officer, Voronovsky stammered, All their arms? 
I'm not going to say everything twice. I've said all, and I mean all. But we agreed that the regiment was not to be disarmed. Of course, I understand that the machine guns and hand grenades, all that sort of equipment, we must surrender unconditionally. But as for the Red Army men's equipment, there is no Red Army now. Bogatyryev evilly writhed his lip and struck his leg with his whip. They're not Red Army men now, but soldiers who will defend the Dawn lands. And if they won't, we'll find ways of making them. We're not going to play at funerals. You've done injury to our land, and now you want to put forward conditions. There can be no conditions between us, understand? Volkov, the chief of staff of the Sirdobsky regiment, took umbrage at Bogatyryev's words. Running his fingers over the buttons of his black satin shirt collar, he demanded sharply, So you regard us as prisoners. Is that the position? I didn't say that, and there's no point in your plaguing me with your guesses. Bogatyryev interrupted him by his manner openly proclaiming that the two officers were completely at his mercy. There was silence in the room for a moment. A muffled roar came from the square. Voronovsky strode up and down the room, biting his nails, then buttoned up his tunic and turned to Bogatyryev. Your tone is insulting to us and unworthy of you, a Russian officer. I say that straight to your face, and we shall know, since you have challenged us, we shall know how to act. Captain Volkov, I order you to go to the square and tell the officers that in no circumstances are they to give up their arms to the Cossacks. Command the regiment to stand to arms. I shall have finished my talk in a moment with this gentleman, Bogatyryev, and will come to the square. Bogatyryev's face was distorted with anger, and he opened his mouth to speak. But realizing that he had already said too much, he stopped and at once changed his tone. Clapping his cap on his head and still playing with his whip, he said in a voice unexpectedly mild and courteous, Gentlemen, you have misunderstood me. Of course I have not received any special education. I haven't passed through a Junkers Academy, and maybe I didn't explain myself properly. But we're all on the same side. There ought to be no feeling of injury between us. I only said that your Red Army men must be disarmed at once, especially those who are not to be trusted by us or by you. That's all I said. In that case you should have spoken more clearly, Commander. You must agree that your challenging tones, all your behavior... Voronovsky shrugged his shoulders and continued more pacifically, but with a hint of dissatisfaction still in his tone. We ourselves were of the opinion that the wavering and unreliable elements must be disarmed and handed over for your disposition. Yes, that's what I said. Well, then, I say we were resolved to disarm them ourselves. But as for our militant group, we shall retain it as a unit. We shall retain it at all costs. We shall take command of it and shall honorably clear ourselves of the shame of having been in the ranks of the Red Army. That possibility you must allow us. How many bayonets will your group number? About two hundred. Well, all right, Bogatyryev reluctantly agreed. An awkward silence followed. It was broken by Volkov. Am I to go? he asked. Yes, Voronovsky replied. Go and order those whom we have listed to be disarmed. Meantime, the insurgent Cossacks had already begun an energetic disarming of the regiment, without waiting for the results of the conference. Avid Cossack hands and eyes searched the regimental baggage wagons, seizing not only ammunition, but well-made boots, putties, blankets, trousers, and food. At this experience of Cossack justice, some twenty Sirdobsky men attempted to resist. With his rifle butt, one of them struck a Cossack busily searching him and shouted, Thief! What are you taking my tobacco pouch for? Give it back! He was restrained by his comrades, but an excited shout arose. Comrades to arms! They've tricked us! Don't give up your rifles! Hand-to-hand -hand fighting broke out, and the resisting Red Army men were driven up against a wall, where the insurgent cavalry cut them down in a couple of minutes. With Volkov's arrival in the square, the disarming proceeded still more rapidly. The Sierdobsky men were drawn up in ranks and piled their rifles and hand grenades, cartridge belts, the field telephone equipment, boxes of cartridges and machine gun belts on the ground. Bagatyryev trotted on to the square. 
Riding his horse along in front of the Sirdobsky men, threateningly raising his whip above his head, he shouted, Listen to me! From today on you'll fight the accursed communists and their soldiers. Those who go with us will be pardoned, but those who try to get out of it will receive that reward. He pointed with his whip to the men already stripped to their underclothes, lying in a formless white heap under the wall. A quiet murmur ran through the ranks of the Red Army men, but not one raised his voice aloud in protest, not one broke from the ranks. The mounted and foot Cossacks surrounded the square in a solid ring, and close to the church palisade, the Sierdobsky machine guns had been trained on the Sierdobsky ranks, Cossack machine gunners standing behind them, ready to open fire. Within an hour, Varanovsky and Volkov had picked out the reliable men from the rest of the regiment. The newly formed detachment was given the name of the 1st Special Insurgent Battalion, and it went out the same day into the front line. The others, numbering some 800, were convoyed by forced marches along the banks of the Don to Vyshenska. Three Cossack squadrons, equipped with the Syadobsky machine guns, escorted them. Before his departure from ust Hapiersk, Bagatyryev called one of the insurgent squadron commanders to him and instructed him, Guard the communists as you would a gunpowder magazine. Tomorrow morning drive them onto the road to Vyshenska under a reliable convoy and send couriers to the villages today to inform the people who are coming. They'll pass their own judgment on them. Chapter 15 Grigor Melyukov spent five days in Tatarsk and sowed several acres of grain for his own and his mother-in-law's family. Then, as soon as his father returned exhausted and lousy from his regiment, he made ready to go back to his division. Kudinov had secretly informed him of the negotiations being conducted with the command of the Sierdobsky regiment and had asked him to return to the front as soon as possible. At noon of the day on which Gregor planned to leave Tatarsk for Kargin, he led his horse down to the dawn to drink. As he dropped down to the water, which had flooded to the very edges of the orchards, he saw Aksinya. It seemed to him that she was deliberately dallying with the drawing of water, filling her pails slowly, as though waiting for him to come down. Nonetheless, overwhelmed by a flood of memories, he hastened his steps. She turned as she heard footsteps, and her face assumed an expression of surprise. But her joy at the meeting and her old pain mastered her. She smiled such a miserable, distracted smile, so unbecoming to her proud face, that Grigor's heart was shaken with pity and love. Stung with yearning, humbled by memory, he halted his horse and said, Good morning, Aksinya, dear. Good morning. It's a long time since we last spoke to each other. Yes, a long time. I'd forgotten the very sound of your voice. You forget quickly. Is it so quickly? Gregor held back the horse, pressing against him. Aksinya bowed her head and tried to fish out her pail with the end of the yoke, but could not get it hooked into the handle. For a minute they stood there in silence. A wild duck flew over their heads with a whistle of wings. Insatiably licking the chalky soil, the waves beat against the bank. On the farther side, the white-breasted billows were coursing through the flooded forest. Gregor turned his eyes from Axenia to the opposite side of the river. The poplars stood with pale gray trunks in the water, rocking their naked boughs, and the willows, adorned with virgin catkins, were hanging over the river like fine green clouds. With a hint of vexation and bitterness in his voice, Grigor asked, Well, haven't you and I anything to talk about? Why are you silent? But Aksinya had regained her self-command, and without the quiver of a muscle in her face, she replied, It's clear we've said all we had to say. Truly. And so it ought to be. A tree only blossoms once a year. And do you think ours has already blossomed? Do you think not? It's strange, somehow. Grigor let his horse go to the water, and glancing at Aksinya, smiled sadly. But I can't tear you out of my heart anyhow, Aksinya. Here I've got children growing up, and I'm myself half gray, and how many years lie like an abyss between us. But I still think of you. 
In my sleep I see you and I love you still. And sometimes as I'm thinking of you, I begin to recall how we lived at Lisnitsky's, how we loved each other. Sometimes as I look back on my life, it seems like an empty pocket turned inside out. I too, but I must go. We're standing talking. She resolutely lifted the pails, put her sunburnt hands on the yoke, and was about to climb the slope. But suddenly she turned her face towards Gryagor, and her cheeks flushed faintly with a fine, youthful blush. It was just here, right by this spot, that our love began, Gryagor. Do you remember? The day the Cossacks went off to the training camp it was, she said, smiling, a cheerful note sounding in her voice. I remember it all. Gryagor led his horse back into the yard and to the manger. Pantolyeman, who had remained at home to see Gryagor depart, came out from the shed and asked, Well, will you be off soon? Shall I give a feed to your horse? Off to where? Gryagor glanced abstractedly at his father. Why, to Kargin. I'm not going today. What's that? I've changed my mind. Gryagor licked his dry lips and turned his eyes to the sky. Clouds are coming up, and it looks like rain. There's no point in my getting wet through. That's true, the old man agreed, but he did not believe Gryagor, for only a few minutes previously he had been in the cattle yard at the back of the hut and had seen him talking to Axenia. Up to the old tricks, he thought anxiously. I hope he won't be getting Natalia upset again. Damn him! Surely it wasn't me who gave birth to such a hound. He stared after his son's retreating back and rummaging in his memory, recalling his own early manhood, he decided, It's me, the devil. Only he's beaten his old father at it. I could kill him rather than have him turning Oxenia's head again and bringing trouble into the family. But how to kill him? Formerly, if he had caught Gregor talking to Oxenia, he would not have hesitated to strike him across the back with whatever came to hand. But now he said nothing, and did not even reveal that he knew the true cause of Gregor's sudden change of mind. For Gregor was no longer Grishka, a wild young Cossack, but a divisional commander, a general with thousands of Cossacks under him, even though he did not wear epaulets. And how could he, Pantolyeman, who had never been higher than a sergeant, raise his hand against a general, though he was his own son. His sense of discipline would not allow him even to consider it, and so he felt that his hands were tied, and he was alienated from Gregor. Even while plowing the day before, when Gregor had shouted sternly to him, What are you standing gaping there for? Get hold of that plow! He had submitted and had not uttered a word in answer. Frightened of the rain, he muttered. When there was not a sign of rain when only one little cloud was scudding along over the sky. Should he tell Natalia? Feeling relief at the thought, Pantolyeman started to go into the hut, but he thought better of it and turned back to his task, afraid of the quarrel that would ensue. As soon as Oxenia reached home and emptied her buckets, she went to the mirror, and stood staring anxiously at her aging but still beautiful face. It still retained its depraved and seductive charm, but the autumn of life was beginning to cast fugitive hues over her cheeks. Her eyelids were yellowing. Rare strands of gray were entwined in her hair. Her eyes were dimmed with mournful weariness. She stood staring at the reflection, then turned and threw herself on the bed, weeping such copious, sweet, and alleviating tears as she had not known for many days. She lay on the bed until evening, then arose, washed, combed her hair, and with feverish haste, like a girl about to be presented to a prospective bridegroom, began to dress. She put on a clean shift, a woolen claret-colored skirt, threw a handkerchief over her head, glanced at herself in the mirror, and went out.